Hi, my name is Julius Horsthuis, and uh, I was thinking about doing a, a Mendel bulb tutorial, and there's been some requests about this. Uh, people asking me if they know any tutorials and how to achieve the kind of the kind of look that 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 my fractals uh, have. Uh, so I thought I'd do one, and I hope to keep it short because I don't want it to be about the software. Um, if you're looking for a particular Mandel bulb tutorial, then please look elsewhere. There are plenty of good things around on the web. This one is more on how to achieve this, I call it, cinematic look of the fractals. Um, I think that's, if there's anything that uh, would set my work apart from uh, other very good things that are out there, is that it looks a little bit more cinematic and less computer generated, less geeky. And this is actually what I'm trying to achieve because there's this danger with this purely uh, fractal stuff that, that it looks too out there and, and, and it doesn't appeal to a lot of people because of that geekishness. So when I'm making uh, any kind of fractals, I always try to think about how to avoid um, how to avoid that and to how to and how to get the most cinematic look. This is my latest one. I've got some um, some renders to show, some like bare renders which are not altered uh, with uh, with After Effects because a, a great deal of that is also um, there's a lot of After Effects work in, involved, and I'll also step through through those uh, steps because I think they are they're just as important as the uh, as the fractal work itself. So this is what I mean with the cinematic look. I try to make a, a specific palette of colors, um, try to get some mood in there, some some clouds, the the shaky camera motion. This is uh, this is all part of part of those uh, of the, of that experience. Others are here. There's some examples of my of my work. These are all all basically done with the same with the same principle so this is actually the first one um, added some some rain effects in in there and there's a lot of depth of field involved and i got i got a lot of questions about how to achieve that that effect as well um which i will also show you So there is, there are a couple of things, like I said, um, with this cinematic look. And let me just step through a couple. Um, here's a, uh, why doesn't this work? That's funny. Here we go. So here's a couple of big screen stills. Here you can see the depth of field. You can see the, the the fall off in, in colors as we go deeper down there, the, 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 the color palette is, is, is turned down as well. This is obviously made black and white, it's not rendered in black and white. Here is a lot of lot of depth of field with these bokeh effects involved. And then there's some, some lighting effects here. Um, so, first question I'm gonna just go through before we start is what gives the look of to my fractals, um, are three things I think that are m that are important. And the first is cinematog cinematographic style. It's the it's the camera handling. What you do with the camera is important. Um, what I, what I always think is like, what could a real camera do in whatever strange scenario we are, whatever strange uh, spaceship or alien planet or or anything you can imagine, you find yourself in. You try to think, what would I, how would I film it? This is something which, which, which is, I think, very important. Like having a camera spinning totally out of control uh, alienates you a little bit from the from the thing, and it goes like, okay, this is so out there, this you 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 don't believe it anymore. Uh, lighting very important. Uh, light it like uh, a cinematographer would light a scene, which is like very important, of course, for for the for the look. Uh, music helps, but that is more a, a matter of taste, I guess. The aspect ratio, which is like m almost everyone, I use this like very widescreen. Actually, 
this is the one which doesn't use it but all these use this aspect ratio has this cinema um, cinema aspect ratio of like 235 to 1 um, that really helps and then there's the color correction so every one of these have been color corrected and none are the, the actual colors that that came out of the out of the Mendel bulb render uh, very important for any movie that we see on TV or, or cinema has been color corrected as well so the second thing apart from the cinematographic style is the resolution um, so I render everything anti-aliased I'll come later to this I'll, I'll come back to that this but this is important I see a lot of very nice fractals there but they have not been anti-aliased and they look um, well pixelated stair steppy etc uh, HD obviously so full HD like 1920 by 810 in this case for this aspect ratio um, and then there is some f some frame blending which means that I don't render every frame but I render um, for, uh, for instance 100 frames and then I stretch it out in After Effects to about 150 frames or even sometimes 200 uh, something frames uh, and this softens up actually the look a little bit it's this digital um, uh, sampling kind of is softened and smoothed out and, and it also saves a lot of rendering time it, it can save up to half the rendering time which is which is, uh, which is a lot because rendering is another issue and also come back to that third one is the content um, fractals they uh, can look a bit bland they can look a bit uniform so I'm always looking for a fractal that has a lot of a lot of different kind of shapes that has a not much uniformity strong shapes and it has cool animation parameters for instance uh, some fractals they they don't really look cool when you animate them because they kind of do this has to have this kaleidoscope effect where uh, or mirror effect even where two two uh, uh, symmetrical uh, things they kind of disappear into each other or they appear from nothing I never really like this and you, you get to see this a lot but there are some so some cool um, animation parameters that uh, for instance amazing surf that that that, that, that don't give you that that thing and that have a lot of more interesting things going on when you start animating them so this is the I think the most important things to consider when making a fractal that looks um, like one of those uh, is to, to, to think about that and now I'm going to of course explain how to get the, the how to get the, um, the shakiness of the camera and how to get all these all these things uh, one thing to say though is that uh, it is going to be a lot of rendering and most of my fractals they contain about um, 1000 to 2000 frames that have to be rendered in Mendel bulb and then I stretch them out a little bit so I can actually get more um, more minutes uh, at my 25 frames per second that I work with um, here in Europe obviously so 1000 to 2000 frames and some of these take 20 to 30 minutes per frame to render so you can imagine this could take weeks and weeks and weeks um, I have a little render farm that I can use so that makes it that cuts it down like to a tenth of the of the render time if you have 10 computers it'll render 10 times as fast um, so I don't think I could make these if I just had one computer to render on it would just be I wouldn't have the patience or anything like that so if you can um, if you can put your hand on any kind of, of, of network uh, with a couple of uh, PCs on it that really helps and I'll also show you how to use the network rendering ability of Mandelbulb, uh, which is very simple, but it really, it really works out well. Especially if you're doing stereo stuff, like like here I've done a uh, stereo one. You actually render t twice as many frames again, uh, so that really adds up. So let's get started for the um, uh, for the uh, the first uh, part of of it, which is inside Mandelbulb, and then the second part will be uh, inside of after Effects. So now we're inside of Mandelbulb. I loaded up a scene which uh, is from the uh, from the film that I called The Engineers, and this is basically how I 
I'm not going to redo exactly what I did because I, I honestly don't know exactly everything, but I can kind of try to show you the kind of steps that you would take um, and how you play around uh, getting some crazy results. So this is a, a strange fractal that I think I once I found somewhere on the web and I, you know, I downloaded those parameters and I've been playing around with them. So they're pretty much unrecognizable to what they once were. And I don't even know exactly where they came from. I've changed pretty much everything about it. Uh, the order of the of the of the different uh, uh, formulas because I like what like I said I'm going to assume you know Mandel bulb and I'm not going to uh, to explain what every button does. Um, so here we are. We're looking at a polyfold sim and a amazing box platinum, a transform, a flippy thing, a gnarly thing, and another amazing surf. So all these things they kind of interact and they they make this very strange shape. Uh, maybe you recognize this thing in there in the middle from that film. Um, yeah, trying to get the camera not upside down. And all these uh, formulas that interact, they, they make the most interesting fractals much more than a, here we go. Yes, we see some very strange, funny things happening. Uh, I really like for the amazing box and the amazing surf, you always have these scale and minus R and, and fold things. And especially that minus R thing is really cool because it changes some things and then it leaves other things alone. So here we like you carve out the surface of it or something. I have no idea like what the, the, the math behind these kind of things are is. Uh, here, fold does another interesting thing. See, it changes the other things, but it let this area here, it leaves that alone. So with these kind of things, you can make really funny things, funny animations. Okay, these integers, they don't really animate well. Well, this thing changes everything, the scale of the transform, apparently. I think this one started out in Julia mode, um, when I try to make something round once for something. And then when I switched off the Julia mode, I, I got these funny spirally things. Um, so yeah, what you do is you find a, a nice camera angle. And when this happens, maybe this a lot of people have this, that you suddenly everything becomes foggy when you come closer to an object. You get that, you don't really want that when you wanna make, you know there's something nice out there, but, but but you can't see it. So there is a, a area here with this button unlocks. Maybe not everybody knows about it. You have this far plane setting here and you can crank that up and then you see further. Uh, very helpful in these kind of circumstances. And actually you, you wanna try and keep that, that a, l a little bit like it's always the same. So you don't suddenly, when you come closer to something, the background starts disappearing. We see that a lot in a lot of films and um, it's not something that I like, so I try to avoid avoid that. Here, if I come closer to this surface, the background starts to fog out. So I have to, uh, instead of, you know, I have to uh, overcome that problem with, with this. So let's go view to main. And oh, let's render out a, um, a small resolution. Maybe no anti-aliasing here, just to, uh, to see that this is the, the raw render of the, of the kind of lighting and things that I used for the um, for the engineer's film obviously the formula changed so it looks different but it's the same it's still the same kind of kind of thing that was the shadow and now the ambient occlusion these are th these are the things that I always use um, in the post process tab you have these I don't know exactly what normals and Z buffer does um, hard shadows important and ambient occlusion is also obviously very important we know how the how that really changes the look from looking flat to looking alive and and and, and very much uh, 3d so imagine i didn't have this lighting settings and i was uh, starting where uh, just in some basic way here um 
first thing I try to do is get one general direction of where the light comes from. If this would be some kind of alien planet and we would be in a, on a, um, outside or it would be even on Earth, we would have the light coming from a particular direction, usually be the sun or the moon or, or some other main light source. So in order to have a main light source, we have here all these light tabs. Um, and actually two are switched on, the rest is switched off. Number two and number one. Let's switch off number two. And let's just focus on number one. If this would be zero, this is what it would look like. So maybe even I can get the ambient light a little bit down. Maybe also to get the fog a little bit down, not too much, something like this. Uh, so I can focus on my main light, which is important. So if I switch that back on and put it back on one, and I can then here change where the light comes from. But the shadow is already baked in. So I have to first get rid of um, of the of the shadow, which I can do here in hard shadows. I can say reset the light one shadow. And then I don't have any shadows anymore. And now I can look at where my light is coming from. So the Y angle is for up and down uh, all the way to the back. And then the, 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 the X angle is for left and right. So if I have it in the middle, it should come exactly from the camera. Um, if I move this to the right, it would come from the right. And if I move this up a little bit, it should come from like this general area here. And I really like the backlight uh, effect. Um, so I got this all the way around, get this up. Now it should come a little bit back from the right. If I make it visible, I could probably even start seeing at one point this would be all the way back. There it is. There's, the, there's my, my light um, that really helps to show you like, yeah, that would be a nice place and maybe a little bit higher it would be out of the, out the shot. So if it's coming from the back, it also has a little bit less effect. So maybe I crank it up a little bit and maybe to get that nice blue area, make the light source a little bit blue and look a bit more like a moonlight. Now I can recalculate the shadows. And most will be in darkness. And now we can see that nice rim light effect that happens. I think I have a really wide uh, field of view. So that's why here it's more to the back and here it's more, but you can see that kind of, that kind of works out. Um, well, then there is these speculars, which if you want to try to make rocks, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use speculars. Um, if these would be kind of like a rocky things, but you would obviously have your colors here. You could say, well, um, let's get some, some more, some less, uh, like reddish tones and get some more maybe grays and, 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 and bluish grays in there. And you can easily copy colors and all these things. You can switch off glue sliders. I don't know why this have this glue sliders thing. I, I like them like this. And by pressing C and V, I can, very simply copy these colors into there. It's always nice to have maybe one very different color. Let's say there's some some green moss growing on these on these. Uh, uh, let's get some. Don't go here. Th these are so unnatural colors. They'll make it look like you know it's from a '80s computer uh, program or something. So don't. I mean, try to be more in these general areas here. And if you want something really funky, you can turn up, but there's a lot of people go, ah, oh, green. And yeah, this is green. This doesn't look like anything a photo would, would ever make, uh, especially not found in nature. So let's go there. And then maybe we can, what we can try and do is we can copy this color into here and we can make this like this. So now of course we'll have one other thing to do and that is we have to look at these areas here. See if we can put that greenish, there it is. There's that greenish stuff in there. That's too much. Now everything turned green. See, it's still too green actually, okay. So maybe this is one glue sliders can also be handy. You can try and put those in particular areas where you, where you want them. Anyway, this is the kind of stuff I do and probably would continue a little bit more. Um, other very important things in terms of, yeah, I, I, I don't use, um, maybe that's another something to say. I don't often use the, the maps, which I think they can be very interesting, but I usually 
I keep them like like this. Sometimes I even use two yeah two choice here. You get these green things. This is this can be interesting. So ambient and depth, two very important concepts in a light. Um, the depth is basically the background color. So this is basically a gradient going from this color to that color, going from up and down. Um, these is yeah usually on on Earth we have this blue sky and maybe towards the horizon it gets a bit more reddish. Um, but maybe in this particular planet we'll have it a little bit more like grayish. So you can see that what what kind of difference that did. And maybe um, up in the sky it's more dark. So here we have this dark thing uh, that doesn't look that good. But it's very important to understand what these two things do. Oh, here's way too much saturation. So let's go down in the saturation. There we go. So now if I put that depth back on, it just comes towards us. And it's like the fog has the color of the of the sky, which it works like that in the software. And then there is the ambient, uh, which is basically how much ambient light there is. And this is also going from up to down. So um, this is the light that you will have on upsiding, up facing, uh, uh, let's call it polygons, even though they're probably not polygons, and these on down facing polygons. So they could have, you could also easily have this, um, this fake bounce light coming sometimes from down. So in some cases you can get some really cool results with changing this color quite drastically giving a realistic light but i guess on default they're the same as the as the depth because you would that's because the atmosphere that would be where the where the ambient light is is coming from so here we go and then we have this dynamic fog i don't use volume light in fact and then there's dynamic fog which i sometimes use uh, but i see it overused a lot of times it's just, i guess when you first start out with this you go like oh this is so cool you, you get this foggy thing going on but it doesn't look very realistic and it has its uses i guess but it looks like everything is has this strange eerie fog around it and if you do this in a negative you get something which is completely out there but it has nothing to do with with what things look in like in, in real life um so i could continue with these lighting things for a while but i think yeah everybody has their own preferences in these and you can kind of see the kind of things you do. You could easily get a second light in there um, if you wanted. And you have these positional lights as well, which you can easily put positional light and you can say, okay, I want the light there. This is kind of fun. Uh, and these are point lights basically. So if you have this like architecture kind of thing, you they're very useful. Uh, maybe have them visible first so you can see where the light is see it's difficult to see it's coming towards us now but it's keeping the same place but you can see where it shines what it does and if you want to then switch that shadow on of for, for this light you have here your second light calculate that shadow and there we get the shadows of that particular light you can also have soft shadows but you can only have that when you have one one light casting shadow apparently not with with multiple ones i also don't seem i don't think i i use that a lot um that's the lighting uh part of it all okay this one is now destroyed but this one's still good um so animation when i have this uh and i go to my animation thing if uh, actually first let me put this okay let me put this into the um, 3D Navi, so inserting parameters, so I get these these colors. And I have this animation window, which is important. This is the actual animation for engineers. So they're about 19 like keyframes, right? Because we all, they're, they're all working in keyframes. Uh, I'm just gonna delete them all. And I'm gonna, if I press F or this key, this will actually turn up in there, as most of you hopefully know. Okay, so now I can, this doesn't do anything only for my viewing. So now I change the camera to something interesting. What's going on there? And maybe even change the, uh, what was the, uh, the funky thing again? Something here. 
Oh, it seems funky. Okay. So, maybe now I have to change this far plane thing again to kind of compensate for what we were talking about before. Um, 100, a little bit more. This is important because this is also what the Z depth will, the Z buffer will later look like. And this is very important for After Effects. I make another keyframe. Um, and I make another keyframe. All right, I'm not doing anything particular because that just does take too long. Um, making something really look nice. And sometimes just nothing comes out and then I go, okay, I'll try it again next time. We'll do it with a different fractal um, F. Okay, so now we've got like three or four keyframes in there. Uh, the light source, by the way, which is maybe important. The light source was in this case, um, lighting, where is that? Yeah, here it is. So the light source was not relative to object. So it was relative to screen space. So when the camera moves, when the camera is rotating and uh, panning, the light source is like it's linked to the camera and it's panning with the camera, which is also really unrealistic. So normally what I would have done is I would have ticked this before I started doing uh, making all these keyframes because now what we're going to have is when the camera is, 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 is panning, the light source will pan along with it. We'll always have it backlit. Even if we rotate 180 degrees, it'll still be backlit, uh, which is weird because you can see the shadows changing as the camera pans and that's not very realistic at all. Uh, so you could easily change that with this. And imagine I would have done this and I would have um, made that mistake. And I was like, oh, I made a great animation, but I forgot to, um, to tick this. What would I do? It may be interesting. So I go back uh, by setting this first keyframe to my window, uh, insert parameter. So we're here back at, this is weird. This doesn't look like anything at all. This should, okay, very strange. In fact, it looks like a little bit of a bug. Some, sometimes it does that. Usually it's not buggy at all, but it, it, it can be. And now it's completely gone. All right, in this case, it might be a good idea to save this somewhere. Um, so let's save it here and open it again. So I close Mandelbulb completely. And open again. And for some reason it doesn't open this. Let's see what happens. There we go. So now we're, we're at the right place. Good. Uh, sa saving a lot, saving different iterations of your of your work is, is, is a very good idea, obviously. Okay, um, so now we have this, insert this parameter, render it out. Let's render it out a little bit smaller. And we have this lighting situation. Hard shadows and ambient occlusion. So lighting, so now we were happy with uh, the way the lighting was, but I'm going to switch on relative to object. And actually it doesn't change anything here, it just changes these, but now they're relative to object. Now when I start moving the camera around, it will actually be locked in world space, not screen space. So how to get these, this new setting, into those parameters? Well, then there is this processings window here where I can say, this is a, in my lighting tab, so I can say here, all the light and color settings. So everything, all the color settings, everything from this tab, I will copy to all these keyframes. Put the values to all keyframes. Um, that should have done it already. Now if I re-render these, we can probably see that these, these should be 
uh, more lit when I start rendering these. Let's see what happens. Indeed. So now when we the camera moves, the light is fixed in world space, which is what we want. Uh, render a preview. That's always a good idea to assess your um, your animation. Sometimes you have to, to downscale a little bit more. Here, this is way too long. It says here how long it should take. Like two minutes, that'll be, that'll be okay. Here's something strange again. There's a, a bug going on. That's a bit damn. Okay, now we're out in the open. It's just for the first couple of some some maybe too close to some geometry and and going in there. This seems like uh, like okay. So for these kind of things, in general, what I do is I try to find an interesting way to how the camera could move, what to, um, how, yeah, like what kind of stuff all the uh, all the uh, all the animation parameters of the of the formulas do, and if I get something cool like something that looks like a spaceship um, going up, then I I try to make something interesting of that, and also try to think about kind of the rules of 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 um, filmmaking and of cinematography, which is um, obviously nice framing, think about the rules of thirds, um, thinking about revelation, you know, camera movement can reveal something interesting. When we see, we see something, then we can go towards it or we cannot do that. We can play with all these kind of things. Um, that goes a little bit maybe too, uh, too far to, uh, for this tutorial. Um, but these are all interesting things to think about and just look at look at other movies and, and things and try to think what makes it interesting to watch. Okay, so the here the beginning is completely wrong, but then the end, yeah, that looks good. And then we have some interesting stuff going on there. So if the beginning is not okay, and we can change our for some reason this thumbnail didn't didn't uh, didn't do that, but we can just get rid of the first keyframe. We can say, okay, we put this keyframe to the um, to the uh, uh, navigator, the three D navigator, and we'll just I'll go here to an empty f spot. We'll just go. So this was the first keyframe. Now we go a little bit back. So we have the same general motion to get a new first keyframe, which is maybe this one. Uh, maybe get that far plane a little bit further back so we have that extra detail there now I'm putting that keyframe in here so now it's there but it should be the first one but we can easily switch these over chop and chop and now it's the first one and now it should be a nice general continuation okay so this is the kind of animation editor I often use these kind of things this will set your the current one to the main window and then from here you can get it from the main window into your 3d navigator and you can get it from your 3d navigator directly to animation or first to here and then with animation you can get it back into there you can interpolate sometimes if there's something interesting going on here i go inter interpolate um i usually so we have 50 frames here if actually if i do 26 and not 25 I get a neat 20, tw 25, 25 division. Otherwise it goes 24, 26 for some strange reason. Uh, and then I can go back to this and, or maybe stretch this out a little bit more. Let's get this 60 frames from here to here and um, tweak some interesting parameter just for that one frame, whatever. And then, um, yeah, and then when you're done, you. You go back to like this. So when you have your entire animation in here and you're happy with it, um, you uh, you start rendering it. Now this is pretty um, important, I think. What I render in, I always make sure that my camera is a little bit wider than the actual shots that I want to make. I'm going to crop it later on. I'm actually rendering in a 2048 by 1024 um, uh animation size and an anti-alias 2. Now this is going to take a long time to render one particular frame. It's the only one that you're going to have it look nice and smooth. So I render PNGs. I save, this is by default, uh, this is off. 
save Z buffer or Z buffer. Very important. This is going to be doing making all the nice things in in your After Effects. Uh, this is on by default, and I switch it off because if you don't overwrite existing images, this is basically how to network render. Um, and I make an output folder. Here's already one. This is a network location. Uh, Mandelbulbs, render 3D god builds, whatever. And um, sometimes I also, maybe when I think the camera is going too fast or when there's too many, like if, if this animation here is too fast, you can easily say, um, maybe I divide every subframe by 1.5, go and put one. So now we, the entire thing is longer. You can see here uh, in total how many so 353 total frames it will be rendering. So usually this this is up, up to like 1,000 or 2,000 for, for the most animations that I've made. Um, then I start saving. So when everything is the right thing, then I start giving it a, a name somewhere. You start saving it because this is also what your file name will be called. And then when you save it, uh, save, and I start rendering it, then it'll start rendering, obviously. And if I open this on another, on another machine, I open the same animation file and press rendering, it's going to network render. It's not going to render the first frame, but it, it will see that in the network location that it's already rendering the first frame because, um, because the first frame will be, will, will be uh, um, already like taken. It, w it won't have any content yet, but it will be taken. Uh, so we'll start rendering second frame. Uh, and the third computer will st start rendering third frame. And then when the first computer is done, it'll start rendering the fourth frame and so on and so on. So the more computers you have, the faster your rendering will go, which is obviously the, 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 the case. But still, this is a quite simple, fast rendering one. I've had ones that take an hour per frame. Um, and this still is... Uh, probably five minutes or, or more per frame. So imagine doing a thousand of those. Okay, uh, next stop is After Effects. So we are in After Effects, which I use for my uh, image manipulation. Um, yeah, this is, I guess, also a really important uh, uh, aspect of uh, of it all. Uh, here is the, this is the, um, Okay, uh, 20, 30 frames, 2,030 frames uh, that I rendered for uh, for the engineers, which is it's called God Builds here, but that was just a working title. Um, so this is what it looks completely raw. Camera goes down, pans to the right, then moves a little bit, uh, dives down. We kind of see these structures and they start... Um, well, they start flying or going. That's just that's one of the things that these fold or or minus R parameters of 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 maybe the amazing box uh, do. So now you're looking at individual frames. Chup 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 chup. It doesn't play real time yet. Um, and so going up. Maybe you should also watch. Uh, Watch what it looks like. Here we have these, this thing fl uh, f flying away. And if actually you look at the at the final um, uh, video of this, you don't see any of these mountains. It's all in, in fog, but the fog is, it, that's all, that's all post work. Actually, some of that is going to be maybe a little bit out of the scope for this tutorial, but some of it definitely isn't. And it's very interesting uh, to see how you can get, I guess, from this, to uh, to this. So um, this is what I call the beauty. Uh, I don't just call it that, but that's a general compositing term. It's just the 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 raw render um, without any kind of channels. And the actually the only channel you can have is the Z depth channel. And I wish there would be others like reflection, specular shadow, ambient occlusion, and so-and-so, uh, which I think they could easily implement because, um, uh, because it's in there. It's, it's definitely in the, in the, 
in the in the RAM when Mandelbulb was working. It just it has no possibility to, to to save these channels. The Z depth is looks like this, and this is basically just saying how far away something is. Um, and as a matter of fact, I may have yeah I've done some. This is what the raw Z depth looks like. Um, this is what the raw Z depth looks like. So what can you do with these things? Two important things. One, you can change the, the color and um, also the fuzziness um, in distance. So how the further away something is, the more uh, maybe toned down or um, the more misty it, it, it gets. And the other thing is that you can uh, use it for uh, depth of field. So I know Mandelbulb has depth of field, but I never use it because this is a, a, a much better way of getting a much nicer result. So very quickly, uh, here's my beauty and I get my Z depth in there. Uh, here we go. Nothing happened. For some reason, it doesn't like my Wacom uh, pen when I do to use the screen, uh, the screen recording software. So the Z depth is in there. So as you can see, it it's the same frame um, as this. This is also a high resolution, so I'm, I'm working in, actually it's a half resolution here, but you can see that this is the resolution that I'm working in. This is full res. Put it back at half just for speed sakes. Uh, and then there's this plugin called uh, Frischluft Depth of Field. It's a plugin for After Effects and um, it's really amazing. Okay, I can drag with my Wacom apparently. And I choose a depth layer and I say the bit that should be in focus, that could be there. And then I crank up the radius and we get this depth of field effect. And you can get you can take this for these kind of things really high. Um, look at that. And then I can say, well, I want this to be in focus and I'll, that will be in focus instead of that. So this is how I did a lot of those um, um, films with this, with this depth of field. But bear in mind that when I'm trying to make this look like an alien planet or something, or uh, as a matter of fact, Prometheus was, one of the scenes in Prometheus was kind of the, the inspiration um, when, they're, when they're landing for the first time on that, on that on that planet. Um, depth of field is not going to help you much because depth of field is actually only um, realistic or we know it only for small things. So the, the higher I, I get this depth of field uh, going, the smaller it looks. It looks like a micro lens looking at something really, really tiny. It doesn't look grand and, and big anymore. This is because the, the lens of a camera um, is, uh, is so small compared to a, a mountainscape that that everything will be in focus, even foreground things will, will usually be in focus. So for this kind of things, I would e either use it just a little bit, so you can barely feel it like this. Here you can see that, in fact, this is only five, that this is kind of out of focus, but not much, uh, or not at all, which in this case, I didn't use it at all. But if you want that depth of field look, um, this is the way to get it. Another thing that a Z depth would be, uh, would be, would be helpful in is to use it as a as a mask for some for some color correction. So, for instance, if I get some color correction going on, um, and let me do some simple ones. Um, let's get this really these curves up, so we have this much brighter thing. But I don't want this everywhere. I just want this in the distance. Now I could say track mat. Uh, the luma mat. Uh, actually, I have to do the inverse luma mat. And now it's only happening in the distance. So you can easily get these kind of things. You can get these in, in Mandelbulb with some uh, with some things, but you can also use it here. And then with the, the curves on, basically, and how tight my curves are in here, I could say how much uh, how much that that fall off would work. And here you can already see, start to see the kind of foggy uh, landscape stuff that I had. Um, 
having some a Gaussian blur in there would help making it a little bit misty. But I don't want that blur to be because now it starts looking like a um, like a depth of field blur. But if I would let's see if I would screen this layer, there we go. I'll start looking like fog, very foggy. Because it doesn't it doesn't blur, but it 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 blooms it out a little bit. It's like a like a lens effect. And this is also what happens in in a atmosphere when 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 the light rays scatter around some light rays will directly hit you so you still see the the actual contours and some will be scattered around by these by this gaussian blur effect um but this again only happens in the distance because of my z depth if i didn't have the z depth um i wouldn't be able to get that effect because i would just have it everywhere and that doesn't look nice it looks like uh, my whole lens was uh was uh, condensated or something and uh, yeah that just doesn't have that that same oh, this is when it only happens in the foreground it gets a really strange effect you want it to only happen in the background so these are a couple of a couple of things um, and then there is of course uh, color correction and you can put an adjustment layer on top of this and I could say color balance and this is a, a very yeah uh, delicate process which I think there are a million ways of, 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 of doing it, um, but it's definitely important to, to try and get the same kind of, you know, a nice uh, color palette. This is of course very toned down. There's not much color going on. It's only the bluish stuff. Um, but yeah, what I did for the engineers. Oh, uh, let me actually open and not save because Okay, so when I did it for this, I looked at, um, actually I think I did look at that, that, that scene from Prometheus and um, tried to copy those, those colors a little bit. And I also used Magic Bullet Look Sweet. So it goes from this to this. And that's a whole another program with lots of uh, presets and um, things and it's very very nice from Red Giant called Magic Bullet Look Sweet um, and that uh, yeah that's the color correction of it all um, I did another interesting th something with this and I used the um, this is a little bit more like I said out of the scope of this tutorial but I have two layers of clouds in here I have a background layer of clouds uh, which you, you see here um, let me actually this is actually the setup of beauty um, the background which is uh, I can just go to the background here which is just it's the camera motion uh, and then there's some just a picture of, uh, of, of, of clouds in there I think the picture is from an HDRI and this was rendered in 3D as Max uh, this is a little bit more complicated because what I did is I, I, um, okay, here it goes even out of frame a little bit. Uh, what I did was I tracked the motion of the of the camera in Mandelbulb. You you can't export the camera motion, which is a pity. Uh, otherwise, it would be much much easier to do this. Um, but by tracking the camera motion, actually, I first had to had to uh, make the uh, had to change the animation in Mandelbulb so that only the camera moved but not the fractal because otherwise you can't track it. So I deleted all, all the frames for the motion of the fractal but not for the camera and I rendered this uh, low res quick render. Then I put that in uh, a program like Buju or Synthize or PF Track to track a 3D camera out of that. And then with that 3D camera, I could make, I could render in 3D Max these background clouds uh, as a separate layer, and these foreground clouds, which maybe don't really seem like uh, very, but they're actually quite. Uh, this is what it looks like, and this is actually Fume Effects, um, and that really, really helped to sell the whole thing. Uh, there's, there's nothing going on there. Um, 
yeah, there's another one. And that other one is, um, hmm. it's weird. Yeah, there's a lot of fume effects things going on here, but I think they're switched off. There they are. So this is the other one. And this is again, a raw render, which is then clipped with the Z depth. Otherwise, if, it's, if, if it wasn't clipped with the Z depth, you would be, would be on top of those foreground objects. But because we have that Z depth, we can actually, oh, this is the wrong, we can actually make it so that it's only there in the distance. But this is advanced stuff, and it's actually only used this, that, that tracking technique for this particular one, and I haven't used it for any of the others. So um, that's quite, um, um, you don't really need to, to know about that in order to make, uh, to make something nice, I guess. So here's my comp, is still full res here. And then this is my final comp uh, where I have uh, some lens flares as well, but you can forget about those. And here you can see the actual size of the comp. This is like, like I said, like 2048, or this one is even maybe 2200 uh, by 1100. And this is only, this is like full HD 1920. So I have my comp, which is larger than the actual cropping window that I'm seeing it through. And here I can easily um, connect it to a, a null. There we go, which I tracked. Again, you need to know some After Effects for this, but it's really, really simple. I got a movie in there with, with a long uh, handheld shot. I found a, a film or a long Steadicam shot. And then I just started tracking a feature in that shot. Oh. If I do that, you don't won't see. So this is just a handheld camera motion, just a, a, a tr a, like a like a track. And then what I only did is I took my final comp. There it is. This is the final comp, and I linked it to that null. It's a you know, it's a parent node. You can link something to one to do something else, uh, and it'll follow that motion. So. It'll have this, this you know, the, the general motion will, will be just the, the, the motion of the camera um, as in Mendelbulb, and it's just very smooth because it's all, you know, it's got every, you know, a keyframe every 50 frames. Um, and uh, then there's just this slight handheld motion, which, um, and I, I, I can do that because I have this this extra, extra stuff on the sides and, and the top and bottom. Um, and there's another another something about this cropping thing is that is sometimes with the emit occlusion things start to look funky around the edges because the when you move the camera the, you, you can see like the shadows disappear in the in the very corners because it because there is apparently there's something out of frame which should cast shadow or ambient occlusion and you know it's there because you've seen it in a couple of frames before but then when the camera starts losing that bit uh, it disappears and the shadow also disappears but the shadow is still in frame and which which looks very weird uh, this always happens around the edges, so uh, rendering a larger size and then cropping it down also gets rid of those artifacts. Um, and then there's one last thing, and that's the, uh, the the frame blending. So in After Effects, you have this thing here. This is default, and then you can say uh, frame blend in a cheap way and on a more computational heavy way. And this actually looks for vectors, and it actually smooths out... Um, uh, uh, the frames in between, and it, it, it doesn't, it really does a nice job in that. So, here I can make from 2000 frames, I can make th 3000 frames. If I did, uh, I think I just did a time stretch. Yeah, the stretch factor was 150. So, if it was 100, it'll be this is what I rendered 2016 frames with 150, it goes up to 3000 frames. And because of frame blending, it doesn't stagger or uh, stutter or anything like that. You can see with frame blending off and on, but it also makes it smooth. It also smooths out some of those. Um, this takes a while. You have to make sure you to switch it on for every layer that you use. Um, so this is without frame blending, and this is with frame blending. It just kind of gets rid of that 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 digital look a little bit. Um, 
So this is the kind of steps that I take. Uh, I think I pretty much went through all of them. Um, maybe you're, you're, you're not, maybe you don't know exactly every step that I did and I think it's going to be too much time uh, and, and to, uh, to spell that out, but maybe I will make another uh, list uh, that can be downloaded and read, maybe a Word document or something with the major steps. But it's more about the, um, it's more about the, the general uh, thinking progress in, in, in how to, to tackle it like it's, a, like it's a real film and to use the same kind of principles in, in compositing. Uh, I use After Effects, but you could easily well do this in Nuke uh, or something like that. Um, to get that filmish uh, look and to use the same kind of uh, tricks that you use for other film, that really helps. Uh, I think that's the conclusion of uh, of the uh, tutorial. And uh, for any questions, you can always uh, drop me uh, a message. And thank you very much.